Welcome to the Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, the Quiet Warrior. Well, welcome to the Quiet Warrior Show. My name is Tom Dutta. I am the Quiet Warrior. And I'm excited to have on my show today, Ms. Patricia Chadwick. Patricia, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's so awesome, everybody. I'm so excited for this interview. And, you know, Patricia, this is all about you. We want to put the spotlight on you. So tell us one thing about yourself that you think nobody knows about, other than if they've read your book, which you're going to talk about in a moment. Well, if I haven't read the book, I the thing that they might not know about is that I grew up in what I might call a very bizarre environment. I was part, I was born into a commune of sorts, <clears throat> a Catholic commune that ultimately morphed into being a cult. And I guess I can leave it at that. And that might be an intrigue that will uh, make people buy the book. Well, you just, so what you just did is you just opened up me, for me to introduce you and, and read your biography and everybody, I want to do that. And I'm going to hold up the book. There it is. This is what we'll be talking about today. It's a book called Little Sister, a memoir by Patricia Walsh Chadwick. And there she is, the little sister. And then on the back, look at the headline. They promised her heaven, but there was no savior. That's incredible. And so I want to read something out of the front of this book here, everybody. Uh, it says, imagine an 18-year-old American girl who has never read a newspaper, watched television, or made a phone call. An 18-year-old girl who has never danced, and this is the 1960s. Imagine that. And then I have another piece of paper I'm just reaching for on my, my uh, studio here, and it's, it says, until the age of 18, I hadn't read a newspaper or perused magazine. I'd never eaten in a restaurant or shopped in a grocery store. I'd never bought clothes or cosmetics or a single item that could be called my own. I'd never heard of Elvis Presley or Frank Sinatra, Marlon Brando or Elizabeth Taylor. I had never watched television or made a phone call. I did not know how to dance. Everybody, how could this happen? And when I tell you about Patricia now, I'm going to build her up so you know the depth behind her accomplishments. You might say, how, how did she do what she did? Listen to this. Patricia graduated summa cum laude from Boston University with a bachelor in economics. She's a chartered financial analyst. She's a founder and president of Ravengate Financial Partners. Ravengate Partners is a consulting firm dedicated to providing business and not-for-profits with education and advice from the financial markets and the global economy. She has a 30-year career in investment business culminating as a global partner at Invesco. She sits on a number of corporate boards. She appears frequently on CNBC. And everybody, if you check out cnbc.com, you'll find some of her contributions. Her website, Ravengate, we'll put in the show notes and more there. And she mentors middle school girls at Our Lady Queen of Angels in Harlem. In 2016, she founded and is CEO of Anchor Health Initiative, a healthcare company that serves the needs of the LGBTQ community in Connecticut living in Greenwich, Connecticut with her twin children and her husband. Now, everybody, I'm here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. We're connected by the magic of technology. But when I have guests on my show, we read their bios and the average audience listening says, wow, this is an incredibly accomplished leader. But many of them don't show vulnerability and talk about the backstory. And today, what you heard up front was how life began for Patricia. So Patricia, I know you've told this story so many times, but I want to get you to take us into the beginning of that. You were a child, you were separated from your parents, you were put into this cult-like thing. Just take us into that moment and tell us a bit about that. Well, as, as often is the case with cults, they don't start off that way. And uh, the organization that I grew up in started off as a club as a Catholic club in Harvard, Mass in Harvard Square uh, for Catholic Radcliffe and Harvard students. And it was after the war when my father, who had fought throughout the war, uh, came back and was doing graduate work at uh, Boston College. <clears throat> and my mother, who was just 18 and had just become a Catholic, met at this Catholic club. Yeah. And they got married six months later and 11 months after that. I was born. 
At the same time, the priest that was the chaplain for the, for the club uh, was um, basically joined with a married woman, totally, you know, a married woman with her own husband and children. And they were the two leaders of this club. And the Catholic priest was a guy named Father Leonard Feeney, and he was renowned. He was renowned for his writings, for his humor, for his poetry. He had studied at Oxford. He was really uh, an international person, all, the way many good Jesuits are. But sometime right after the war, he started to become much more rigid in his interpretation of Catholic dogma. And as with many religions, the Catholic Church has espoused that you need to be Catholic to go to heaven. And at the time, it was right after the war, and the whole um, aura of ecumenism was burgeoning. And so the local Archbishop of Boston, Archbishop Cushing, pushed back on Father and said, please don't um, support that. And Father Feeney said, absolutely not. This is the dogma of the church. And interestingly, my parents, totally sided with Father Feeney. They wow. believed that. My mother, perhaps being a convert, why would you be a convert if you weren't <laughs> convinced? And my father, who had grown up Catholic, and I often wonder whether perhaps his four years as a naval officer during World War II might not have influenced him in some ways. We have his diaries from, from the war, and there are days in which he wrote, what I've seen today, I cannot even write. And perhaps there was a, a, his own PTSD of, of a sort when he came out of the war, war. And maybe his solution was to look to God. I, you know, I can't make the judgment for them. Uh, but at that time, they followed Father Feeney. And along with about 50 other people, they created a religious community. And Father Feeney was the leader. And they all took a vow that they would obey Father Feeney. And that vow ultimately, I think, was what really proved fatal in the events that unfolded. And it wasn't long after that, that everything started to change. The 50 adults included about 12 married couples. Yeah. So the, the number of children, I was, you know, one of four or five children, became 39 children over the course of about five or six years. And then Father Feeney had everybody change their names and you know, they had to, my mother, who was Betsy Walsh, and my father, Jim Walsh, became Sister Elizabeth Ann and Brother James Aloysius. And that was what I called them. <laughs> From then for no more mommy and daddy. And the girls, the little girls were called little sisters, and little brothers were the boys, and then big sisters and big brothers, thus the title of my book, Little Sister. Well, listen, to catch your breath there. I'm, I'm horrified. I have to say, and I'm going to surprise you at the end, we're going to do a review on your book that I've actually just posted on Amazon. But everybody, this is a teaching moment. Listen to the resilience behind Patricia's voice telling this story. And I have to say, Patricia, when I think about Catholicism, I want to just say publicly, and this is not a religious show, but because we're talking about it through the context of your story, that I was born and baptized a Catholic. And my daughter, we put her into Catholic school. She's at a university now, uh, Mount Allison University, and it's a Catholic-based school. And mm -hmm. so my faith guided me. But if you know my story, a little bit about my backstory, I had adversity. I grew up in a violent home. My father was uh, somewhat of a drinker and a military man. And I gave up on my faith. And I remember back then asking myself, and didn't really know what God was at that age, but I would read this thing they gave me, the Bible. And I learned later in life that the Bible is actually God's story and he's teaching us through his story. It's, it's not meant to tell us we have to be and do everything. Right. And yet today we, Christianity and all sorts of other religions, I just believe that there's one God and I believe in what, what you said and what you taught me in your book. Faith can get you through difficult things. One of the things reading the book that just caught my heart was this, this experience you had in that uh, place with the way you had to eat, the way you had to act, the way you had to behave. And I learned a long time ago trying to develop my own self and courage that there's some basic human needs every children has, and that's the need to be loved, the need to be enough. And here they are. They're changing your name to Anastasia. They're taking you away from your parents. They're telling you to call them a different name. 
And I know this, that something happened to you in your childhood. It has to be that gave you resilience because many people who go through that adversity that I've met go to drugs or alcohol. Uh, they don't make it to be as successful as you are. So I want to take, give it back to you, Patricia, and just get us into the story and tell some gritty details. You don't have to be giving away the story about what it was like uh, and why you think you had the strength to persevere. I wrote down on my paper, The Big Punisher. And I'll, of course, I was looking at that going like, oh my God, that takes me back to my childhood. And I'll tell everybody that when you finish. So tell us about some things that happened there and how, how come you made it through? Well, perhaps the most traumatic thing for me was when I was six years old. Uh, and it was a Sunday in November. I remember it very, very clearly. And that was the day that all the children who were six, uh, three years and older, and I was six, my sister Kathy was four, my brother David was three, and we were separated from our parents. So my parents kept my, ba my baby sister, who was about four months old, and my sister Peggy, who was two. Uh, but the rest of us were you know, basically forced the little sisters to live together and then the little brothers to live together. And that was extremely difficult. I realized at that point, I was six years old, I felt that it was up to me to become the mother for my little sister. I was separated from my brother David, yeah. but my sister Kathy, who was only four, suffered tremendously. And she would go sometimes for days without eating, for which she would be beaten. And so I took it on myself to do what I could do. I prayed endlessly to an array of saints and God and whatever, trying, trying to convince them to make her eat and to make her be happy again. Of course, she was missing our parents. That was, that was you know, and with her own therapy in years later, she certainly came to understand that. But the fact of the matter is I, I was helpless in many ways except that on those times when I could quickly sneak her bowl of soup in front of me and give her my empty bowl and eat her meal as well as mine, just so that she wouldn't get beaten. Wow. Um, I can't imagine. That. I'm going to hold the book up again so we let everybody see that incredible cover. I, when I read it, there was somewhere in it. And by the way, I, I listened to the audio book. And for everybody, uh -huh. you need to get the audio book too and listen to it because the narrator brings it to life and, and you're in there, your voice is in there. I think that to me made it more emotional because the narrator was able to use different voices and I was actually yeah. there. Kind of reminded me a little bit of like being inside the movie Harry Potter when they're all at the table eating, although there they were laughing and happy and their parents had sent them there and they knew they were going back to their parents. Here you were abandoned. But there was something in there about uh, when this cult grew that when Father Feeney was tell me if I'm wrong, was told, you know, by the church not to do certain things, that it had to be kept in private. And, you know, the, forgive me for saying this, it's not a criticism, but the, the, the person who hasn't been through it, when I think about this whole thing, how it went for years, can say, how, how's that possible? How come a parent didn't run across the street, and knock on a door or go and privately reach out for help? And, and then I realized the only thing I can think of is why I didn't, when I was living for 18 years in my own home with a a violent, uh, difficult, traumatic uh, uh, childhood. Why didn't I go and reach for help? I get it. For some reason, it's it's fear. Maybe like you said, like you told me, it's your parents believing that if they do this, they'll go to heaven. Just help us understand a little bit about that when you're in these this situation. Yes. Well, I did talk to my parents years later about it, uh, and my father basically, I thought, gave a wonderful visual image. And he said at the beginning, when these changes took place, changing their clothes, changing their names, separating the children, uh, forcing my parents into taking vows of celibacy, which they at first said, absolutely not. Yeah. But then they realized that if they didn't do it, they would be kicked out. They promised to obey Father Feeney. And my father said, you know, every one of these changes he and my mother would meet and talk about. And they ultimately each time said, okay, I see. we'll make this one more change because we feel that our children are getting the most pristine 
Catholic upbringing. And my father said eventually the snowball was like, he said it was like a snowball. Yeah. And you can first turn it and you keep going. And then he said, it becomes too big to move. And he said, by that time he was stuck. And as is very much the case in a cult, they uh, tend to, one, prevent people from engaging with people on the outside. So we spoke to nobody outside. Parents were not allowed even to communicate with their own parents or with their siblings. And when parents of the adults would die out in the world, as we called it, they weren't even allowed to go to their own parents' funerals. Wow. So, it, it, you know, it, it, that cultish thing, break the ties. They've got no place to go. They've got to stay. And it took me a long, long time to accept the fact that I grew up in a cult. In fact, you will know, having read the book, the word does not appear once. Yes. And I, it was, I, my children are now 26 years old yes. and have flown the coop. Uh, but uh, when my daughter was about 20, she came home from college one weekend and I was getting towards the end of, you know, the writing part of my book. And she said, Mom, I have two things to tell you. First, you need to stop everything until you finish the book, which I thought was great because here's my daughter <laughs> reading this bizarre, you know, life of her mother, and she's growing up in a fairly social environment. And the second thing she said was, you have to accept the fact that you grew up in a cult. And it was only then, you know, after six, seven years of writing the book, that I went, I thought about it. And I have come to fully respect her incredible insight at the age of 20 <laughs> and uh, admit that it was a cult. It, and, you know, in a, in a way, it doesn't make me love the place any less. I yeah. think of it still as my childhood home, but I now see that the behavior of the leaders, yes, uh, particularly the woman, Sister Catherine, uh, her, she, she ruled with an iron fist. And when she died, two years after she kicked me out, when she died, the place started to fall apart. I uh, I remember when that that character first came into the 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 book, uh, and I started I started, and I shouldn't say hate, but I really started despising uh -huh. just the way that it was portrayed. And one of the things I want to honor you and let make sure my the guests hear this is a teaching moment that when Patricia wrote this book, I wrote down here and I read this somewhere that you wrote it with no self pity. And you could have been in that book and being all over with anger and torn people down. You didn't do that. And for you, I tell you that I'm so impressed and inspired by that because it takes a lot of courage. Uh, that means you've processed your, your yeah. frustration and anger. And I want to use this now as just a moment to share a story with you about my father that in January 18, my dad died from an unexpected heart attack. And for 10 years before that, I was estranged from him simply because I grew up in a I call it my own little cult. It was like whatever happened in that home, you couldn't talk about it. It was a secret. And I thought as a kid who can't use my prefrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain that develops to be able to rationalize that this isn't mm -hmm. right. Uh, kids just believe everything they're told and it gets wired into us. That's why many of us like me go and deal with suicidal thoughts and things and don't get through it because we think it's real. Well, my father for some reason god spoke in my heart patricia and i went and had coffee at starbucks with him i had mm -hmm. kept him from my daughter for so long and but because of my own pain and dad told me i said dad tell me one thing what was it like for you growing up and you know when you're a kid your parents don't tell you because they try to protect uh -huh. you what he told me was he grew up with the same kind of culture pain that he brought into my life. And Patricia, when I heard that, something changed in me. It felt better. He said, I love you, mm -hmm. son. He said, I'm sorry for what I did. But something passed between us. So here's what I want to say. The connection is this, that all those other children, you've written this book, and I honor it for a reason, but by you having the courage to tell a painful story, many won't for fear of ego, for fear of what will people think of me. You're freeing many, many other children, even if they weren't in that room who, like me, we're in our own cults and you give us courage and hope to tell our stories. When my dad told me what he did, I now can go out and I can help other people. Uh, mm -hmm. The leaders that come on my show who are still in pain and stuck. The one thing I found is a common thread that when we can discover that we were searching all our life for the love of a parent that we thought we didn't have, that changes everything. And when my dad told me that, 
I stopped thinking I needed the biggest paycheck or the biggest career or material things because my own self-worth was always there. He loved me. So that's what I want to ask you now. The big question is there you are. How did you know your parents loved you? How did you get through that understanding that? Was there anything? There was. And I think that the five of us Walsh children were particularly lucky because when we left Cambridge and moved to Still River, uh, we were then forbidden even to speak to our parents. So uh, it was a world of silence. And my father, who was a very intellectual man, um, had you know studied philosophy, theology, mathematics, uh, was assigned, as is often the way in a cult, to something that had nothing to do with his abilities. So it's almost, we're going to humiliate you or put you in another uh, environment. So his responsibility was to fix the cars. And as you can imagine, with a group of about 100 people, 39 children and 60 odd adults, we needed quite a few cars. So every single day, he was working on, on the cars in, in between the two houses. The houses were maybe 100 yards from each other or maybe yeah. 50 yards from each other. We would walk to and fro. And so I remember the first time it happened, he was with his head under the hood of a car, changing oil or whatever he might have been doing. And as I went past him, he looked up and I looked at him, knowing that we were not allowed to let a word pass between us. And he just smiled and he went like this, which was his way of saying hello. Wow. And my, I have three sisters and a brother. My three sisters, uh, uh, all four of us, all five of us agreed that this, this happened to us all the time. And for my three sisters, he had a little pet name for each of us. It was the same name. And he always referred to each of us separately as my little, my little princess. And even when he was 90 years old, uh, and I was practically 60, he would still say, how is my little princess? Wow. And so that, that little wiggle, the occasional meeting me on my birthday, and we weren't allowed to celebrate birthdays. Yeah. And I would find him on his, and he would find me uh, just to say, I, I didn't forget your birthday, my little princess. And it was just, oh, it made me so blissfully happy. And it was kind of the glue that held us together um, until we could get one of those community meetings that happened every four or five months. So there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that both my parents loved me. And as you know, I dedicate the book to my parents. Yes. I, one of the reasons it took me as long as it did, I think, to write the book was because I was fearful that people would hate my parents. Mm -hmm. But I have discovered that that wasn't the case. I also think to the point that you made, I really, by the time I was 60 and started writing the book, I had processed a lot of this. And even to this day, I mean, maybe not right in my early 60s, but today, if I were to meet Sister Catherine, the woman that was the tyrant that ran the place, yeah. I, I don't have an anger toward her. I would like to say, did something horrific happen to you in your childhood that made you feel that this was the right way to bring up children. Because uh, it, it, it was beyond bizarre. But I will tell you that of the 39 children, sadly, six of them have already died, mm -hmm. but of the 39 children that r remain alive, at least two thirds of them reached out to me after my book came out and said, thank you for writing the book. It's in some cases, one said, it's freed me. There was one person who wouldn't talk to any of us for 20 years. She said, it's just too traumatic. She and I have become really, really close friends again. And uh, I don't expect each of them to write their own story, but I've somehow validated their ability to talk about it now by having written it. And I tried very hard to write only my own story. I don't, you won't find a story about any other child in particular, but the shared experience must overlap 85 or 90 percent, at least while we were there. Of course, once I was kicked out, one, you know, went yeah. my own way. <laughs> well, we have a few more things and then I have some surprise for you here, but my, as I said to you before, my brain is three-dimensional. It goes on these journeys, so forgive me for being oh, that's great. A, little, a little wild here, but you know, everybody, my shows aren't scripted. Literally, we get on, I haven't met Patricia and sat down and talked about the story in great depth. Uh, but what you said, when you said about uh, 
what if you said if i had if i in the future had met sister it was a sister catherine or sister uh, catherine yes uh etc i had this vision of jesus christ on the cross hanging with his hands crucified and still alive in that moment where he said forgive them father for they do not know what they do and when you asked her did something happen in your childhood i believe that hurt people hurt people and that something happened most of the kids on the street are on heroin and meth if you really dig deep and find their mm-hmm. secrets someone planted in them when the age when they everything coming into the head the brain is believed something was planted that they're not enough they're flawed they're it's their fault and, and therefore that guides them to be confused and sometimes mm-hmm. do things you're such a hero to all those people and i want you to know this uh, patricia and you don't have an ego i know this but those that tribe is your tribe but beyond you there's a tribe all over the world of people of parallels to the story i wrote it in my review of the book which i'll share that yeah. my, my story connected to yours not because i grew up in a cult but because i grew up in a wild home which is my cult and sure. it took me a lifetime to write my book and and forgive my father and learn about his story but when somebody reads your book i hope that everybody finds one thread in it that they'll go wow that's my story and you've given the world hope. It's a it's a great purpose. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say here about the Feeney, did they did the Catholic Church ever issue an apology? Or I know he was kind of kicked out or whatever when this all came apart. But was there ever a formal acknowledgement of any of this? He was excommunicated when I was about five years old. And then after Sister Catherine died in 1968, about three or four or five years after that, there was a reconciliation. And uh, it was, there was a reconciliation with the Catholic Church and they did not request Father Feeney to say, I renounce the fact that you have to be a Catholic to go to heaven. They wanted the Archbishop of Worcester and the Archbishop and the Cardinal of Boston, Cardinal Maderos, um, and Archbishop Flanagan in Worcester really, really, really wanted to bring the group back into, into the Catholic Church. And so, I mean, we always considered ourselves Catholic, and I'm yeah. considering myself Catholic to this day. Uh, and we will argue, well, maybe it wasn't a legitimate excommunication. It wasn't for holding a dogma of the faith, which you couldn't possibly excommunicate them for. It was because, Father, it was for disobedience. Right. You know, the Vatican ordered him to come over to Rome, and he refused. He was ordered by his superiors, Jesuit superior, to go to Boston, to Holy Cross College, and leave the Boston Diocese, and he wouldn't do it. But long story short, there was a reconciliation, and I think that's healthy and good. Yeah. But there was a lot of, of you know, interfighting within the group once Sister Catherine died, which often is the case. The leader yes. leads, is gone. And it can't, it can't hold together. And fortunately, that was the time where the children shared with the parents the physical abuse, <clears throat> this big punisher that you referred to, which was a, about a three-piece long, three-foot-long piece of hose. Oh, and the children were beaten with it. And they basically told the parents, and the parents had never known. Wow. Oh, my. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say, when you said that, uh, tongue-in-cheek here i went back to my child and i think mine was called the big hot wheel track or the big wooden spoon and <laughs> and i'm telling you that the hot wheel tracks if you know what i'm talking about they were made of vinyl and they hurt so i can imagine everybody just think about this your ch- children are hit with this hose and live in fear uh i wanted to show it up again here we're talking about little sister of memoir patricia walsh chadwick what an incredible uh book everybody that you need to get i have one more question for you before we move to wrap up and i want to honor you with a few things that there was a study done in canada it's a canadian study and they asked 90 year olds what are your top three regrets and in no order these were the top three i didn't reflect enough i didn't uh leave a big enough contribution or legacy and i i didn't reflect legacy contribution and i didn't um, take enough risk Tell me this, by the time you're done with this world, with the work you're doing in this book, what is your hope? What will the world look like? Well, I hope that the little tiny ways in which I can be of help 
<clears throat> will have a meaningful impact on, if it's not a lot of people, it's, you know, the people that, that I have worked with. That's why I mentor um, girls in, in Catholic schools in Harlem. That's why I started the, the company, the LGBTQ healthcare company. The, a lot of these people are deserted. They feel unloved, they feel scared. And so for me, that is my way of kind of giving back. And so I hope that those, you know, those benefits will live on. And if you mentor somebody, and I was mentored amazingly well once I left yeah. uh, the center in my, in my business, which was a man's world of finance. Yes. And all my mentors were men. There was not one that was a woman, but it set me to realizing how valuable, and mentoring is all about someone who's seeking and someone who's generous. And so, I benefited so much that I want to play that role. And hopefully that will lead those whom I'm mentoring now to mentor others in the future. And that would be a wonderful legacy. That is a wonderful legacy. Everybody, I'm going to surprise uh, Patricia now with a review of the book. I've actually written oh. this. It's posted on Amazon. I actually listened to the audio book. I just want to say that again. And, and I have the physical book. And here it is. Uh, it's a five-star review. And the title of it is Inspiring Courageous Heroism. I listened to the audiobook version of author Chadwick's incredible reveal. In this book, you will find the jagged edges of a horrifying ordeal that no child of God should have experienced. Listening to this book took me back to a moment three months before my father died recently. He revealed a story about his childhood that I never knew. It freed me from a lifetime of pain and guilt. The most heroic part of this book is not just the wonderfully written pages, but author Chadwick's decision to write her story for her children and other children alike to know. That is the gift for when we can understand our parents' story, we can find peace and comfort in some way. I recommend this book for everyone. Hmm. These are the threads in this memoir that can change lives if you discover them. High praise for Ms. Chadwick. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's really, really beautiful. You're welcome. I'm going to go online and read it. <laughs> uh, yes, it's been submitted. And as Amazon likes to take control, they'll send me an approval and I'll forward that to you by email. It should be, oh, they usually, sometimes it'll take two days. Now, everybody, if you're watching the video here uh, and, or the podcast, come find the video. But you'll see on my screen, there's this funny light on my screen. And this is definitely a story that God's hand is all over. This morning in my studio outside, it is marine clouds and fog. In, I'm in the west coast of British Columbia. And the sun, as we did started taping, the sun all of a sudden broke through the clouds and started sending a ray uh, that's enveloping my where I'm sitting. That doesn't happen <laughs> on, bef on my shows. For some reason, it happened today. And I believe that you know, God is, is, is teaching us something here through Patricia. Patricia, the last thing I'm going to do is tell you that we're, this is the second honor of this book. I'm launching in 2021 what's called the QW list, uh, QW for Quiet Warrior. It's a book list. And we're positioning it to be an iconic brand. I've already created that, that will be known around the world. And here's the genesis. When I became a CEO, it, people would say, Tom, do you have any books that you've read to recommend. When I was, co when I coach others, they'll say, what book should I read? When I got my first CEO job, my board gave me a book to read. It actually was called The Oz Principle, based on the Wizard of Oz about giving and receiving feedback and courage. And so your book will be inducted onto that list and we will oh. be bringing you back for a five minute ceremony online. And uh, that list, I hope to market it globally where or institutions, organizations, anywhere where they're seeking wisdom and knowledge that they will find your book on it. The second and last honor for today will be we are, we are officially being inducted into the Quiet Warrior Tribe. I may not have oh, you. told you, but the image on my screen, by the way, Patricia, behind me is actually the award. And so I had these made. They're called Challenge Coins. And you mentioned your father in the war. Uh, they were started in World War I. And soldiers would carry them in their pockets to signify commitment and community. And they would have fun. If you showed up without yours, you would buy someone maybe a drink. Today, they're used around the world for first responders, you know, organizations to create community. So I had these handcrafted and painted in the U.S. Sorry, Canada. And the front of the coin is the, the front of the coin is actually the show uh, image. And if you see that guy there, guess who that yeah. is? And on the back actually is the hero's journey narrative 
Uh, that's Joseph Campbell's work about the hero's journey, where we take it based on something difficult. We come back a guide yeah. or a shaman to teach the world. comes in a cherry box, and forever you'll be on that list. Now, there's only 40 of these a year that go out, and there's 8 billion people on the planet. And I, wouldn't, oh. and I know I... That's a unique club. I... <laughs> I finish with this, that I will not give this award to a guest that comes on with an ego and doesn't share a story that's authentic and is vulnerable and says, I'm, I'm doing something purposeful in the world. And so that's the commitment. When you carry this coin, you will never stop using your story to change others' lives. So welcome to the Quiet Warriors. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for everything. It's been a lovely time. Uh, you're thank welcome. You so on the last word, I'm going to give it over to you to ask uh, to have you tell us where to find your book or any of your work or to connect with you. Well, I do have a website and it's very simple. It's simply patriciachadwick.com. It has uh, a variety of podcasts. I blog a fair bit. So all my, my blogs are, are there. It has historical uh, stuff. It has videos. It has radio shows that I've done. And uh, it also has a link to be able to buy the book. The book came out in hardback, but it's now in uh, softback, soft cover, and uh, it has now something that's really good for um, book clubs. It has those questions at the end so that you can engage in kind of thinking through some of the, the challenging issues. Uh, and you can easily get it on Amazon. Unfortunately, so many bookstores these days are keeping their inventory very low just sure. because people are not walking in, but certainly online it's easy to find. And I would be most appreciative for any reviews. And thank you so much, Tom, for, <laughs> for giving me a review because reviews matter. I'm a first time author. I am writing another book and it's about my, my experience growing up on Wall Street. Uh, whereas I mentioned earlier, it was a totally male environment. And I started at the lowest rung. I started as a receptionist. Wow. And eventually was able to get to be global partner. So I, I think it's going to be a fun story. It doesn't take you quite through the agony of, <laughs> of my childhood, but I think it's going to be fun and maybe a little bit funky and hopefully very honest, which is, you know, making me take some big giant steps. <laughs> well, that's who, that's all you are from what I see. And I got to tell you that my brain went here again. My wife, Anna, I've been, been married 25 years. She was a banker and she started out in the world as, as an administrative officer in a male dominated environment. And believe it or not, she told me when I met her that one day the manager called her into his office and said, I'd like you to sign these admin reports. And asked her to sit on his lap. Oh. <laughs> now, Anna, Anna, she excelled at the bank and she has become a thought leader. She blogs and I w I'm going to connect the two of you at some point to talk. Oh, that her. would be lovely. And uh, I promise you, I will be available for anything you need for that book. I'll do a review or whatever's needed because I think this, that, that side of the story tells us what you did with all this uh, to be successful. So everybody, find this show on your favorite podcast station. It's an international audience. And give it a high rating to honor Patricia Chadwick. Get this book, and I'm showing you again, Little Sister, a memoir by Patricia Chadwick. Get it, listen to it, read it, and go on Amazon Goodreads and leave a review to support this first-time author. That's without us. She's not known. And also look for a fully produced YouTube premiere video. We'll be starting a watch party. We'll release it the same week as the podcast. So you can enjoy this entire broadcast that we did today visually. So Patricia, we'll have you back again. But thank you so much for being on the show and being patient with me with all your time. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been lovely. It's been a delight. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Quiet Warrior Show. Create is a motive-based leadership development firm. www.kreat.ca